Good morning. I'm not muted, right? All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone tuning in to our forum today, titled From Within Before Without. My name is Chan, co director of the NUS Show 2021 and leader of this uh, critical architecture cluster. This is the second event in the cluster specific forum series that we have convened as part of the NUS Show 2021 an online exhibition of thesis work completed in a previous academic year. The exhibition is a collection of indiv individually bold architectural questions that are positioned in current and future realities, and a collection of propositions that reflect the importance of architecture and the role that architects have in shaping the physical environment around us. Convergence occurs along five discursive threads, which form the five classes of the show, critical architecture, history and heritage, sociopolitics and geopolitics, technologies, and urbanism and environments. Each cluster is uniquely positioned to probe the limits of the discipline and to respond to the demands of wider society. Do visit our exhibition at nusmrgradshow.com slash 2021 if you haven't, and be sure to share it with your friends who may be interested. The exhibition also exists in the form of a hardcover book a physical compendium of arresting ideas and visuals to serve you at your fingertips. You can order our NUS MMARC Show 2021 book through the form drop in the YouTube channel. As part of our efforts to reach out to a larger audience and to contribute to the architectural community beyond our thesis, we have convened a series of forums and discussions that will bring the diverse issues we are tackling into conversations with academics, practitioners and experts from other disciplines. We wish to propagate the inquiries initiated and to anchor the NUS AMOC show as a series of curated positions rather than individual voices that is important to, uh, for local to global audience. All our events are streamed live on our website and they are uploaded onto our YouTube channel after the event. So if you have missed any of the forums, you can find them for your convenient viewing on the website through the event schedule or on our YouTube page. Today's public forum is brought to you by the Cluster of Critical Architecture. Behind the impressive facade of architecture lies a world of chaos and anxiety, a discipline constantly questioning, doubting, and re-evaluating itself, its premises, and its methods. The Critical Architecture Cluster embraces this anxiety within the architectural interrogation. Borrowing, experimenting, and playing are used as methods of research and inquiry. Questioning the stubborn or the adherence to traditional methodological and formal notions, such as that of hygiene or efficiency, within an increasingly uncontrollable and unpredictable world, these theses explore fresh approaches, propositions, and representational methods to critically expand the discipline of architecture. Without further ado, I'll pass the time to Tan Yi Eun Samuel, Research Assistant in the Department of Architecture, National University of Singapore, who is our forum moderator today. Hi, uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, thanks, Chan, for the introduction. Uh, as you said, my name is Sam, and I'm a research assistant here at the department. Uh, and I'm very delighted today to be moderating this event. Uh, I look forward to a really robust conversation that will follow. Um, today, the Critical Archite Architecture Cluster has organized this forum to discuss the discipline of architecture. Uh, to put it very broadly, we're asking the question today uh, of what architecture really is. Uh, what are its methods? What are its outputs? What distinguishes it as a discipline and what disciplines it? And my personal investment in this is great. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, the kind of design that I do and the subjects of research I'm interested in are not things one would traditionally consider to fall under the purview of architecture. Uh, I'm in, uh, yet, it is architecture that has given me a frame and a body of knowledge to talk about and perform it. Uh, to get us all in this space where this issue becomes critical, I want to start by offering a short provocation that reads as follows. Uh, the disciplinarity of architecture is today steeped in anxiety as increasingly institutions, corporations, and economical forces threaten its legitimacy in both the academy and practice. Much of this might be traced back to historical tendency for architects to look outward, borrowing from other, uh, from or working in other purer disciplines like mathematics, history, the sciences, the social sciences, and more uh, to legitimize and concretize its own ambiguous skill set. 
Uh, today, it is prudent then that a cluster bearing the name critical architecture, lacking any predetermined or even deterministic associations with history, social science, or technology, might begin by first looking inward rather than outward. What is architecture? What is an architectural skill? What is the subject of our discipline? Or even what is a discipline? And to interrogate this, we'll be using the thesis as a vehicle for discussion. Uh, as you may have heard in our earlier event, the role of the thesis, the thesis is a curious endeavor. And this year, we've seen a whole range of diverse projects that have been executed in different modes and methodologies, producing vastly different outputs. Today, we'll be hearing from Yong Chen, Anthea, and Natasha, who present three projects that are in their very delivery, pointing us to possible pathways of illumination, pathways that may help delimit where the discipline ends or even where it begins. And following this, we'll engage in a roundtable discussion of these works as they relate to today's provocation. And for this, we're very honored to be, in, uh, to be joined by our very own Dean's Chair Associate Professor, Eric Leroux, uh, Vice Dean of the School and Director of the Master of Architecture Program, uh, and Adrian Wilson, Partner and Intermediate Designer at Wilson Wooten. Uh, I will give my full introduction of our distinguished guests later in this event, but first, we have Guo Yongchen uh, presenting Samoga Bahagia. Uh, Yongchen has been part of the planning and organization of the MARC show, series of forums, and hopes the audience finds these sessions useful. Yongchen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sam, for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Is it good? Okay, so hi all. Um, my thesis is titled Samoga Bahagya, as Sam has, as Sam has said, or May You Achieve Happiness. So I'd like to begin by first of all thanking my thesis advisor, Prof Lillian, as well as Sahar and Ian for advising. So I'm, I'm just going to go very briefly over the thesis um, today and some of its background, and very briefly, some of the investigation I've been doing afterwards and how that has helped me think about the work I did and perhaps open up some questions about it afterwards. So the thesis emerged from a desire to re-examine the conventions of the city and its efficient or infrastructural space, and the way it shapes behavior and strips agency in the service of capital. So I approached this by drawing on the alternate value of leisure instead, um, spaces that would redefine the position of citizen to leisurely acts, to leisurely acts instead of capital, and thereby change attitudes towards using the city. So this is in a large part in, drawn from the landscapes of um, local artists such as Chong Su-ping, whose Malayan picturesque <coughs> style I felt captured and made visible a kind of local disposition towards productive leisure that seemed to be lost today in the way of representing and building the city. So this leisure specifically seemed to be drawn from the particularities of the land, be it the activity it hosts, the terrain, um, like, like fishing, gardening, or its atmosphere as, as heat, that seemed invisible to other modes of drawing place and thereby went unvalued. Thereby, or therefore, central to the methods and outputs of the thesis were three so-called um, architectural paintings uh, of the sites and their broad propositions um, by the mouth of the old Singapore River on the right, uh, Fort Canning on the left, and in the current Parliament House in the middle, um, recuperating their histories. Uh, they act as a space to induct new citizens um, to acts of leisure or reflection or agency. So in the same way the landscape works shown earlier, tried to visualize the potential of the space, the architectural paintings together with the supporting artifacts below uh, intended to try and do the same, um, to become a device for both representation, but also as a method of design through the drawing um, of the flattening, the, the flattened layered pattern cell, or motifs rather. So the company I present the thesis, I also wrote a very short story about a, a couple, um, Anand and Sunita, who embarked on a journey of citizenship through the three sites of the Citizens' Parliament, which is the project. Um, so I read out an extract covering the second site, which is the, the Boulder Fields, you can see here. Right. So the Boulder Fields was unlike the other nine ornamental historical gardens at Fort Canning. Here, the neat path dis disappeared in the layers of red earth. Picnickers reclined on the boughs of trees, laden, on, laden with mangoes, papayas, and more. Some sat on the grass or on the earth, others on top of huge, half-buried boulders. The pink sandstone protruded from the soft red soil, excavated from nearby tunneling. Clambering on sunken roots, they picked up fallen fruit, pocketed seeds, and avoided the anthills. The long beans, hanging from the netted poles, were still too small. First known as Bukit Larangan, or the Forbidden Hill, this is where the Malay kings of old had built their palace gardens of bountiful orchids full of local trees, flowering plants and herbs. Stanford Raffles, the colonizer learning of this, had also planted nutmegs and peppers here. It was very short-lived. Only local species, it seemed, grew on the hill. Through repeated visits over the last six months, they became more confident. 
looking at their hands, planting seedlings, picking fruits. And they learn which boulders concealed kitchens and stores, hidden wells of rainwater, or shelters to rest. And they knew when the rain was coming by smelling the earth and feeling the wind. Their favorite spot under the rambutan trees and behind the fruit drying boulder was unoccupied. Meandering down, they stepped over the, the scattered concrete abutments, which were slowly being displaced by the knot roots. The boulder garden was like this, a place that remained loose and messy and real. And over the days and weeks, Anand had piled a few of these into, um, into low seeds and planters, um, one of which had been filled with soil and, and, and in which periwinkles thrived. So together um, on the hill, Sunita and Anand put rambutans and watched the sun slip below the city. So the story later takes them to the eighth bridge, which is a fishing site near the Anderson Bridge, and that looks at water as something inhabitable or alive with fish and plants and swimmers. And we're looking at a kind of older and more intimate relationship with the water before the entire place was dammed up and turned into like a drinking reservoir. And so the, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of architecture that meanders and dips and disappears over the day, leaving people stranded in place or waiting in the water. Yeah. So where the border field is a place for wandering, the bridge is a place for waiting in contrast with the other infrastructural bridges that span the river. And finally, to the underground chambers at Parliament, which faced the idea that the location of Parliament has a kind of enthusiasm towards nationhood or democracy, where the anthem was sung for the first time, for example. So it returns to the place for learning of language and local songs where the song echoes and leaks into the air and mixes with the, with the, with the speech of Parliament. So that was my thesis as it was submitted. And all this is very different from what I had started with, um, which was to which was this kind of study of nuisance instead um, as a means to which to critique the infrastructural city. And this was born of a, some kind of desire to find value in how agency of people interferes with ordered architecture or how architecture itself can interfere with other architecture. And it's not very clear why this is important in the early stage of the project of the thesis. It's, it's more like a hunch I wanted to explore um, for the first, the first part, first half. So for example, here I was looking at graffiti through experiments, the kind of marking of place, um, forming them into manuals or drawings that show ways of evasion and obstruction, how best to go about it. Or here, um, how to feed balls in the outskirts of the city and find make use of old roads and road shoulders. I tried for like a, a half a year or more to make this work, but I think I didn't. Perhaps I didn't understand it well enough, and I still don't understand well enough. Um, well enough to make it architecture at least, and kind of turned back towards leisure, as you saw, with its own clearer value set. And all this was left behind. But I'll get back to this very shortly. So after the thesis ended, I was lucky enough to be asked to contribute a little bit to an exhibition of landscapes, which was to be an outgrowth of the thesis work. So this required that I go back and look at and think about this Malayan picturesque, which I had borrowed from so much, um, which was to be, which was, and they are in other similar works, like this Balinese genre painting, as you can see here. And think carefully about this claim that the drawing itself revealed invisible realities about space, in this case, tropical local space, which I used to design. So I tried stepping away from the broad proposition for this exercise and look at it just as a staging of people and activity and atmosphere to begin with. So I tried this out and it's quite, and it's, it's admittedly incomplete, a rather crude sketch here in the project, which is a procession of dog walkers <laughs> um, at Tanjong Lu. It happened to be while I was thinking about this. Um, I had, so I thought I'd try sitting on the roof of the car instead of in the car um, and just watch the dog walkers and, and the joggers and the cyclists kind of go by um, from the condos nearby, just walk, walk down the road. And I kept putting down the paper as kind of object centric way of looking at, uh, of navigating leisurely space. And here, trying it again, an observation of an old lady um, who feeds chickens near my block. Right? And so the drawing here, when put down on paper, become a, be, became to me at least a way of conveying the potentials of a very normal car park, or could be any car park in a sense. So in a sense, the staging drawing, the, the, the drawing of a stage potential itself, even though this effort is going to be very rough, um, begin to take on a kind of constructive logic, a spatial proposition on its own, in, without a built proposition. And I, I realized that while doing this, um, like somehow this scene staging had always been quite central to the methods of the thesis, even though I hadn't realized it, or I hadn't kind of fixed on it early on. So for some going back to the nuisance drawings, uh, the manuals drew and proposed potential actions within the city. Uh, they proposed a disruptive alteration to space by relating, relating instructions on how to go about these actions, right? Or where there was, even with, where there was architectural proposition in light yellow on the top, right, as in this board, it kind of receded into the background. And the clusters of people gathered around and making use of this space became overly emphasized in the project. Um, although I didn't, I didn't pinpoint it at this point. And here, for example, in the chair experiment I did in the first, in the first half as well, um, the visual proposition of the chair that might be present in unlikely spaces um, alters the value of the curb or the road or the grass verge independently of the physical chair actually being in the space. So the, the, the picture of the chair, the proposition of the chair being there in, in this set of pictures attempts to convey that message. 
Of course, the staging of people in the final thesis drawings, um, le um, learning, music, uh, lounging, fishing, might also fall into the category of staging of activity. So to, to end off, what made me wonder was how important actually the book proposition was to the project in the end. Like, what was, what was I actually chasing? Basically, what if the panel board output themselves had been drawings of the sites without the building or without the real intention of building, but with the same kind of leisurely intent of trying to convey the potential of space, right? And building from that, then what, would it be right to say that the thesis was an architecture? Or on the flip side, could the drawing and scene staging itself, the display proposal, which is the boards and the artifacts and the collection, almost like, a, like an exhibition style, independently of the book proposition, be considered an architecture or an architectural proposition? Because this opens it up to a lot of um, vulnerabilities, right? So for example, architectural photography is then architecture. So on the left is a, a composite photo by Andreas Gersky. Right, of a stock exchange. And it's quite similar in a sense of, to the, the, the Balinese drawing earlier, which is it's, it's a kind of density of people, right? But perhaps here, the constructive logic of the image isn't apparent. Perhaps I'm not aware of what the proposition is in this photo, and therefore um, I can't pinpoint it, right? But would it then, if there was, would it then be considered architecture? Or if architecture is a proposition of space through the visual medium specifically, then what about exhibitions or curation, such as in, the, as in Dylan's school videos, the exhibition on the right, um, which looks at the, the lawn, the space of the lawn in a certain context? Um, is it the act of making that is important in this case, or is it, and if so, then does this qualify as architecture? But either way, I feel like as I leave the thesis, um, I'm less decided about what architecture actually is, um, having thought about all this. Um, so I'm be glad to hear from the panel and from discussion on questions, perhaps there's some clarity that might be granted to me. So I'd like to end off. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Yong Chen, for that. I mean, uh complex and, and a thoughtful project, but also um, your confusion. Uh, good to see you <laughs> confused, uh, <laughs> quite rare. Um, <laughs> next, uh, we have Natasha Lee, uh, who will be presenting her thesis uh, called Still Life. Uh, Natasha loves staying at home so much that she decided to do a project about home. Uh, and during the time she does leave the house, uh, she enjoys taking long bus rides and walking around the neighborhood to find random objects people have collected and curated as a reflection of their living. Uh, everyone, please join me in welcoming Natasha to the stage. Hi, everyone. My name is Natasha. So I'll be presenting on my project, Still Life. So my thesis was a personal journey to understand the meaning of objects and their role in defining a home. Following a partly autobiographical approach, it takes departure in my experiences of living with my grandparents as a child. Ten years have passed since my grandmother moved from where she used to live in Singming. Today, she lives with us, with the family in Haogang. In these 10 years, I am not entirely sure if she misses home or if she has found home. The shift in living spaces and attachment to objects has led me to question the definitions of a home and what forms this title. Extending beyond a shelter and a place of belonging, home is one that allows for dwelling. Home, a place where we recall memories, activities, and the daily routines whilst finding traces of our own identity. Inanimate objects are given agency as they make claims on space. As we bring objects into our homes, we set the ideas and principles that we cling to, adding to the functional meanings of these commodities. Studies of rental flats in Singming and across similar housing types were intended to understand the underlying modalities of how memories and meanings attached to different objects. Through the Infer Ordinary we, by George Perec, we examine with a lens that pays attention to the details we have often missed. Examining the smaller fragments and traces, we start to uncover certain hints and ideas previously unnoticed. The first inquiry starts by looking at the doors of the Simming flat. The doors marks the threshold, but also serves as the most intimate facade of what a stranger can see of each home when the door is closed. Beyond a physical infrastructure to mark the entrances, uh, the entrance of one's homes, we uncover traces by its inhabitants while observing closer. Objects left unintentionally or intentionally offers us a glimpse, if any, the characteristics and ways of living of each individual. The next phase of the next phase of research looked into objects within the home. And as I managed to enter the nine units, um, I documented the objects found within the homes with photographs and sketches and later translating them into these nine um, drawings, capturing the floor plan as well as the objects within. 
The investigation of objects within the home was also extended by looking at HDB homes of Singapore as well as three flats to allow for a more comprehensive study across different housing types and presented in different modes of representation. The characteristics of spatial types of memory, routine, identity, and social spaces are then translated into messing models that demarcate how, for instance, identity objects are often found on walls and vertical surfaces. The second portion of my project looked at designing three different skills, following the same idea of how objects define home. So objects separating an empty space void of living to a place embedded with a recollection of items reflecting each individual. Um, this project went about examining um, everydayness and objects and how they give meaning to a home. And at different scales, it looked at a home unit, building unit, and neighborhood unit. It explored the main structure of what um, of what makes a home defined by its objects and cut by the categories of memory identity and social relationships. So at this point, we understand, um, I understand in my project that it was simply not a house that makes a home, but the occupants with the artifacts and traces deposited through time, they add up to the individual lived experience within a home. But the struggle I had was with um, the translation of studies from the home unit to the neighborhood skill in, in what you can see in, the, in this series of drawings. So my, my original intention was to portray a series of objects um, placed in a neighborhood so that when the neighborhood changes um, in, its, in, its, in its buildings, you can, you can, these objects are then retained in terms of um, the community garden, community kitchen, and certain um, other programs in, injected into the space that people can hold on to and can remind them of homes. But while the translation of studies from home units to the eventual design of objects within the building and neighborhood scale, still contains uncertainties in, term of, in terms of its effectiveness. I question now if architecture as we understand it to be is even necessary in the set of design solution. Beyond spaces and structures to curate key experiences, perhaps we may also look into the representation of architecture. The topic of home and object is one that is highly personal to every individual. While practice in architectural school teaches us the concepts and methods of translation, I ask myself, how much of what we design is legible to an individual without any formal education in architecture? Reframing my project as a next step forward, these series of floor plans form the connection between objects and architecture. Returning to these units I captured through my, through my drawings, I offer each unit um, a drawing as a memento documenting their homes. So um, I actually went back like, and gave like, the units um, these drawings that I made. And so I asked myself here, what is my contribution throughout these pieces um, in the realm of architecture? And here it is to provide an object that each homeowner can hold on to, reminding them of what their home is and used to be when one ever moves. A still life portrait drawn for each individual, documenting what home is to them. A still life portrait that marks the experiences I had visiting these homes, as well as my thesis journey to figure out and understand the role of objects in defining one's homes. I hope for a continuation of this floor plan series as I extend the study to the rest of the units in the block and maybe other homes in the future. As an architecture student as well as an artist to capture a series of still life home portraits, each drawing acting as an object, holding different meanings from a diachronic interaction between a network of agents. These objects that implicate a range of modes of engagement that, and response from homeowner to an outsider looking into these homes. Architecture here represented as a medium that allows for people to hold on to a fragment of what home means to them and what our perception of home means to us. Thank you. Thanks, Natasha, for this, this project. I mean, and, and it's really great to hear how the thesis has extended beyond just the project in school. Um, I think we also probably have questions about the analog mode of working. That's probably something that we can discuss later. Um, but for now, uh, finally, uh, for our last presenter, we have Anthea Pua, who will be presenting her thesis, How to Live with Another. Uh, Anthea is currently dabbling in graphic design before she starts work proper. And she'll be working as a research assistant for a year here at the department while she figures out what to do with her life. Please welcome Anthea. Hi, um, let me share my screen. Yeah. 
Can you do it? Okay. Um, hi, good afternoon. I'm Anthea. Uh, today I'll be sharing my thesis, How to Live with Another, in relation to the limits of architecture. Um, so, How to Live with Another is an experiment of architectural co-authorship and a proposition which addresses a current domestic dilemma in an architectural lab. So, two key issues are explored in my thesis, co-authorship co and coexistence, or living with another. My project considers the presence of foreign domestic workers within the HDB public housing flat. Um, they are needed but barely accommodated for in these tight domestic spaces. And in Singapore, living domestic foreign workers can be found in one in five households. So the project began at home uh, from, my internet, uh, from my interest and research of unschooled drawings. And I explored this with the help of my grandmother and her live in um, Indonesian helper, Azri. So grandmother has drawn memories from the various homes that she has lived in from Xiamen to taking a boat to Singapore. And Azri has also represented the houses that she has worked at. And they each end their narratives in the, in the representation of the current set that they occupy together. So their representations show that there can be various modes of knowing, representing, and creating space. And the focus of the project at this point was very much about the failure and the limits of architectural representation. So hyper-realistic vignettes were made to show iterations of spaces that are co-produced by the protagonist as they live with another. So my space, our space, uh, your space and our space. Uh, how should architecture matter in a question of living with another? Michael Foucault's idea of theory and Colin Rowe's transparency comes to mind. So with Foucault's order, it becomes clear that the layout of HDB flats has a way of uh, imposing social hierarchy uh, that orders the relations of people and objects in the house. And with Rowe's transparency, um, spaces contain multiple meanings that overlap, intersect, and can go in between object, uh, others. So using those theories, I analyzed four situations of the flat through drawings, uh, correlating to how both grandmother and Azri situate themselves in relation to each other and to household objects. And it became evident that while they have a respectful coexisting relationship, tensions, social hierarchies, and boundaries are still present. So here, the potentials of architecture, it, its epistemological and professional capabilities, a capacities to address the production of space that can speak to social and class-based proximities is then tested. Uh, three devices conceptualized at the scales of body furniture and space of the HDB flat respond to the complexities of this relationship. As the protagonists construct the designs at one to, at one, -to one scale, they negotiate and materialize their own desires and needs through personal modifications. And line drawings here show household materials and methods such as the knotting of raffia on bamboo laundry poles, crossing over um, from domestic chores into the architectural studio. So I'll just go into the devices briefly. Um, chapter one is smoke screen, which is a multifunctioning uh, screen for privacy. Um, so here we have, uh, during her spare time when the kitchen is not used, as you can push um, a small table by the window and hang the screen on the ceiling hooks. And light streams into a privileged window and the screen creates a soft shielded nook in the dark space. She can see people coming into the kitchen, but not the other way around because of the glaring light. Both shield and nook encourages um, iterative uh, experimentations. And next we have party for tea party for two which is a negotiation for harmony in response to the lack of neutral spaces in the house as Azri sits in the, in the kitchen most of the day and looks out into the living room. So the sewing machine is now the center of the flat um, and above it three, canes of, three rings of cane um, from which tea bags are hung to dry form a chandelier, perfuming the space and coloring the space um, hues of amber. This reorders the living space as a maker space for two enabling the partaking of communal activities. So as you now cohabits the central space with the excuse that she's making a gift for grandmother. And when the chandelier drops uh, from the weight of the tea bags, quilt making commences. Stitched by grandmother's bare hands, the tea bags are reconstituted into a weighted quilt for Azri, a symbol of uh, comfort and a gift of independence. And each time they share tea, the quilt expands. Lastly, we have a uh, dress of independence as an enabling device for grandmother, which is made by Azri. 
So here, she makes a walk-in walking device concealed by cushioning origami modules that are a variation of folded footwaste boxes. They overlap like shingles, sealed with tapioca starch. When not in use, the dress can be opened up and hung on curtain rails to filter light. So with that, th this is how to live with another. Uh, I want to make the door for the kitchen for protect the oily if I cook. So I have to tie the bamboo stick with the rapia. Inside the string, I put the lemongrass and banana leaf so can cover the, the door. Popo also can exercise. If I cook, I also take care of the In the Inside the string, I can use because go sweet potato and onion also. And afternoon, I also can sit down and I hang the bamboo. Sometimes I drink coffee. I teach Popo how to make so can help me. Popo give me present. Name is a tilam. She swing herself. The tilam I can use for sleep. I am going to make the dress for Popo. When Popo play game, I can pull the the paper. I hang at the rubber band. When finish the drink tea, the white wet tea bag, I can hang at the rubber band. So the glue, I boil the water from the tapioca. Now Popo can wear the dress. And also I can hang at the curtain. I can open. Uh, I want to make the door. Um, so as you can see, my project is quite far away from what practice anticipates architecture to be. And it's far from the scale of a building with the largest physical scale and installation. It concluded as a narrative with modes of making and conveyed through various mediums, uh, drawings, vignettes, photography and film, as an attempt to begin to discuss social issues from a broader stance. Um, the project went down this uh, iterative and collaborative strategy through a back and forth partnership between Grandmother and Azri. But before that, I did try to come up with strategies that were more like conventionally architectural in the process. So we, uh, I went, um, I proposed an architectural toolkit in the form of a residential handbook that would inform people how to live with another. And I was also heavily inspired by Keith Robinson's spatial devices that challenged and reshaped boundaries within a home. But it didn't quite fit the texture of the project. And another um, exploration uh, was a series of material explorations, of which one was a raffia string. And using techniques such as like knotting, weaving, and knitting, I tried to turn it into a surface to change, um, to, to expand the materiality of, of a household object. However, these didn't get anywhere. Um, and on hindsight, in the lens of how we currently see architecture, architecture seems too big and both too big and too small. So it's both too large, uh, clumsy and awkward to deal with human relationships on an intimate and personal scale. Um, and yet it's simultaneously too small, specific to individuals households and routines. So there exists this paradox where architecture is too particular and too complicated, but at the same time, it has to occupy and speak to both spectrums of the scale. So ultimately, the value of my thesis as I see it is that it raises questions that cannot answer be 
ca that cannot be answered by the work itself, but the question of what architecture is can never be answered within the architectural field because it cannot be answered. The answer is not going to be found within the limits of this field. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you, Anthea, for that. That um, I mean, it's very interesting to see um, this type of object making done uh, between people who are not really designers themselves and, and see that orchestrated in a process. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about it more later. Um, and thank you again uh, to all the presenters for your projects and your reflections um, today. Uh, we're going to take a short break, a three minute break now. Um, and uh, Chanba time is that coming back 4.40, I think. Exactly, yes. Yeah, exactly 4.40 before we continue with the next segment, which will be a discussion uh, of these projects. Um, so I'll see you all in a few minutes.
<clears throat> I can't tell on. Okay. Um, so uh, it's now time for us to get into these projects and conversation. Uh, but first, allow me to introduce our two guests who've kindly taken their time out on this weekend uh, to join us. Uh, first up, we have Eric Leroux, everybody here should know. Uh, Eric is Vice Dean, um, Director of the Master of Architecture Program, and also Dean's Chair uh, Associate Professor at the School of Design and Environment, National University of Singapore, uh, teaching a new generation of architects to be committed to uh, the complexities and potentials of architecture located along the equator. His design research combines passive performance, pattern, and simplicity as a poetic response to the equatorial hot, wet climate and a dense urban context. Elaborated on his architectural monograph, uh, Deep Veils, published by Oro Editions in 2014. His design work and contribution to the discipline have been recognized by the American Institute of Architects, being elevated to the College of Fellows, AIA, in 2020, and his buildings have won several AIA New York and AIA National Design Awards. As Vice Dean, he leads the transformation of the School of Design and Environment at the National University of Singapore with over 40,500 square meters of new and renovated facilities by 2023. Next, we have Adrian Wilson. Um, Adrian is an architectural and graphic designer and together with photographer Tobias Wooten, found, uh, she founded the uh, Karlsruhe um, Germany-based creative duo uh, Wilson Wooten, which makes photography and design around architecture and the arts. They work with architects, curators, and visual and performing artists to represent themselves and their work across print and screen-based formats. For five years, Adrian was a researcher at the ETH Future Cities Labor uh, Laboratory in Singapore and was a frequent guest juror at the NUS School of Architecture. Uh, to cure her Asian homesickness, she cooks Asian food for her German family and friends and makes her own sambal. Eric and Adrian, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, just to start us off, I think um, we should probably acknowledge the elephant in the room um, that seems to be a phantom at every jury that doesn't quite conform to the traditional boundaries of an architectural project, which I'm sure happened at all three of these projects. Um, and the question is, in your opinion, what is architecture and what makes something architectural? So we're going to start with the light question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we might as well get it out of the way, you know. <laughs> I'll just yeah, hack, I, hack away at it for the whole 40 minutes. Yeah, I would have the same question for, for all of you, because you seem to have an idea of what's, what's in and what's out. Uh, I heard the words conform and um, uh, what else was in the last one? Uh, conventionally, what is and what isn't. Uh, I probably have a much looser definition than, than Eric. Um, I, I also heard the word, is it built or not built? Um, I think it's a way of, of looking at and creating space. How do, people, how do people occupy space? I think is one of the fundamental questions, whether that's under the roof of something or not. And we're getting a very hard lesson in that these days with the pandemic, right? That everything is one and a half meters. We have to keep our distance suddenly, um, according to this, this phantom rule. So um, I would say it's, it's about making and creating space and, and also representing those ideas of space. We've also seen three very strong um, uh, styles or modes of, of doing that um, and, and helping people to, to be aware of their own space. Um, it was really exciting to see the participatory methods of that embedded in all three of these, these projects. Um, maybe I just chime in here. So first, let me just send a little bit of uh, thanks and appreciation to everyone who put the and US MARC uh, show together has been really a fantastic um, accumulation of all of your effort. And it's great to see such um, amazing work over the difficult year that you all went through. So congratulations uh, to everyone and also to the team here that has put together these kind of uh, forums that continue the discussion, what goes on day to day at NUS um, into the public realm. So great job, everyone. Mm. I. I I, I want to maybe go back to a conference that bothered me um, in 2017, which was what Lillian Chi put together, um, which was situating domesticities in architecture. And I happened to be 
on a panel um, as a, I forget what it was, a responder or, or moderator. And there was a, um, a presenter who basically argued that everything is architecture and that everyone is an architect. And this stuck with me and troubled me greatly. Um, and I think what the, the question, Sam, that you're, you're posing is, and I think we need to separate it. Architecture as a kind of field of cultural inquiry is the entire world around us. And that can be from the natural world all the way down to everything that we make. Mm -hmm. And that can be engaged and interrogated and thought through through a whole series of disciplines and techniques and devices. And as we see um, in these three examples of thesis, we saw a filmmaker, we saw an illustrator, we saw a painter, we saw a sculptor, we saw a performance artist, um, all kind of weaving into the projects that were all talking about that larger world that we all inhabit as humans. Um, but I think that that is very distinct and different from a job and mm -hmm. the kind of questions of the profession. So mm -hmm. back to that conference when she said that everyone is an architect, yes, everyone can participate and does mm -hmm. participate in the material and spatial world around us. But I still hold on quite firmly that there is a certain amount of skill set that is different and that it is a expertise and a kind of specialty that we hold as an architect with a capital A or lowercase a, however you want to do it, which is different than just being in the world. Um, and that that skill set, um, you know, feed, yes, feeds into a kind of notions of professionalism, maybe a kind of career, a kind of job. And there's a reason why there is a potential future job for you because people who exist in the world and want to do things in the world, but yet they cannot do it. So even though they want to do architecture, they cannot be an architect. And I don't mean just professionalism, it just means they don't have the skill set. So yeah. I think we need to kind of a little bit have a more nuanced um, understanding that Architecture is everything, and I think that's why um, definitely we see at NUS and many architecture schools, there's always students looking to the kind of periphery or the kind of larger field of culture in space and material. But yet there is also a disciplinary center, um, which is what you go through through a kind of education. And it is a very specific expertise um, that, well, I think is also very important. Mm -hmm. And a yeah. key distinction, right, between the practice, the discipline, the the body of stuff, and the people who make it. That's right. Yeah. No, I think you definitely bring up a really good point, uh, and I think this professional this this issue of the profession of architecture is something that we 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 should probably get to today. Um, but I mean, I, I am reminded every time I discuss uh, this issue of the discipline of architecture, the the, the essay that Wigley wrote. Um, and, and, and he makes that point also, right? Architecture is almost never about itself. It's always about things that are outside of what we think of as architecture. We, we, we don't do projects on architectural subjects necessarily. Um, and I think that's very interesting to consider, um, especially with, with these three uh, projects. Um, I mean, you mentioned the skill set. Uh, that's something that I think is is really crucial to discuss today, right? What 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 is the architectural skill set, for instance? Um, I mean, a project like Anthea's, uh, it gets complicated, right? Because she's not the one. And correct me if I'm wrong, but at the end of the day, the the output that you have, those objects were not really made by you, um, or at least we're not made to think that they were made by you, right? They're they're made to look that they were made by other people, um, and and that your role in that as ostensibly an architect, what, how would you describe that in relation to those two other participants and agents in your project? Um, well, what, how, how it 
uh, how, how the project was carried out was that I, through the analysis, it was, um, I identified the, the, like, I identified um, tensions in the household and how I may, through, through like small devices, how can devices that they can make and take ownership of as they make it, um, they can then, it, it, it has, um, it has an implication on how they carry out their lives after the device, the device is built. So without the observations that I made or like the prompting that uh, I did, they wouldn't, they wouldn't um, have invented something to sort of help themselves. There needs to be a, a intermediate role that comes in, even though they are co-authors of of these devices, I feel like the architect's role is still is still needed. Um, it's like a trigger. It's like a something to be like to begin to discuss what can be done to help to improve or mediate these tensions, um, for them to live together. If that answers your question. I'm wondering if our guests have any thoughts on her. I mean, Eric, you were at her actual crit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, of course. I, I mean, I appreciate your project very much. But um, I mean, if I'm going to come back to the, your kind of positioning, whether you're kind of engaging in the wider uh, cultural frame of architecture or the kind of professional frame, I would say you're definitely engaging in the wider cultural frame. And you should go to LA and be a filmmaker and just forget trying to be a professional architect. Um, because uh, I, I'm just gonna you know, stir the pot a little because I, I, I think that that's where the, you know, you'd be a great director, which is like facilitating a whole variety of action occurring in time. And then you, know, you even show your project at the end through, through the medium of film. Um, now, does that degrade your architectural education? No, you would leverage it and you would probably do extremely well, um, but if you were going to fold back into the kind of uh, the, the frame of the profession, um, those skill sets that you've developed um, are, you know, they probably could um, be applicable, but at least not in the way architecture is kind of practiced today. I mean, it would definitely be a kind of a fringe, a kind of on the fringe of the profession. Um, I might imagine that you would leverage those skills and um, doing workshops with a, you know big corporate clients that have a whole uh, set of contradictory um, demands, and then you know having giving agency and empowerment to people in those companies might be a way of doing something. Um, but I, I think when it comes back to your own agency as a kind of a facilitator, right? I mean, it seems like you, I mean, I, I would just be encouraging you to go that direction. Um, and I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. I mean, I actually mean it in a kind of an encouraging way. Um, and actually, I probably would say this for all the, um, the, you know, all the students who presented, you know, graduates, now I should say graduates who have presented, that the kind of, the way that the profession is kind of framed um, at least now, um, isn't quite aligned to all of the skills that you have presented, uh, you know, presented through your projects. So that's why I'm going to go back to, you know, filmmaker, illustrator, painter, sculptor, performance artist. Great. Mm -hmm. Go do it. Yeah, but that's, I, that's what I got was per performance art hmm. out of that last, that last piece. And, and yeah, someone said earlier on the role of the architect in the greater picture. And if you think about it, either within an architect working with kind of regular participants, citizens of the world or architects working within the architectural office, right? Each person has their own skill set, And as our, arch as our profession has uh, expanded, there are lots and lots of us now. It's also gotten a lot more specialized, right? So within the office, you have the rendering guy, you have the model group, you have the 
the um, project lead, the person who meets the clients. And then you have the guy, it's almost always a guy with his name on the door. And we always say that's his design, that's his work, but it's a, it's a, whole, um, it's a whole crew of people, right? And in Anthea's case, uh, did she produce the work in the end? No, someone else did. But that's also true for built work, right? You work with a contractor and they have subcontractors and they have little green men who come and put the thing together. So what's, what's our output, I think is the, the question. And in Anthea's case, is the output um, her direction of this is what we should produce based on our observations? Is it the objects that are made? Is it the film of the performance of the objects, right? And, and that, you know, depending on what the answer to that question is, might also decide the question of what's her title, what's her role in the whole scenario. I would encourage, I mean, if, you know, for everyone, if for all three of the um, presentations, if you removed all of the line drawing, and the axonometrics, um, if you remove it all, you just scrub it from those presentations. Are we, are we still in an architecture school? My hunch is probably no. And we're probably in a fine arts school, but yet you are using the drawings, you know, basically sampling and rifting on Alberti and that kind of long history of line drawing to code yourself symbolically that you are still in the discipline of architecture. I mean, in the profession, right? Um, but everything that you're, but I, but I, my hunch is that you're actually not, um, if I'm gonna be, you know, a little bit of a troublemaker. So just imagine that those drawings aren't there and you are still talking about architecture in that, again, that wider, field, wider cultural field, and you're talking about very important um, concerns of architecture, but you are outside of the profession. So this begs the next question, what are those, what are the kind of disciplinary um, concerns that are within the profession? As Adrian was suggesting, the drawings, you know, or if we say the, the line drawing, which is a set of instructions, you know, as one is it's a visual device to communicate ideas to clients who are hiring you. And secondly, it's a set of technical instructions and dimensional instructions and material specifications to communicate to contractors who are building um, your building. So that has been the kind of center of the discipline. Um, I, I would say, you know, it's still very relevant today, probably in our, in our very near future, drawings will no longer be relevant. They will be relevant to communicate to clients, visualizations, but those might be films, um, but the instructions will not be through drawing anymore. I mean, we're already kind of tipping that way. It's through BIM, it's through other forms of modeling. It will be, I'm, I mean, AI will be my drafters. I, I won't need to hire any of you to intern. Um, it will, you know, we won't need those kind of forms of instruction it will be a little more direct so i mean I, I just throw that out there because i think it then comes back to your projects if you scrub out the the drawings how do you still claim some kind of expertise right i mean it was interesting i think it was um if i recall at the beginning the, there was i don't know if it was young churn who was talking about um or maybe it was Chan in the introduction was saying that there was experts, right? An expertise outside the discipline. Well, what is the expertise inside the discipline? I mean, I think that's a question. What is your, when someone calls you an architect, what's your expertise? Yeah, I think the issue that you raised, Eric, of drawing is, is very, very uh, um, poignant of this particular panel since these projects are so drawing heavy. Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I maybe toss this to Natasha because I did mention it just now. It's it's that that is like actual drawing drawing not 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 simulated drawing not um, any other kind of very loose use of the word drawing but it is actual you know diseño and and graphe uh, what 
how do you feel about this uh, this 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 um, proposition that Eric is making? What what is your architect? What is the architectural skill that you are um, employing in your project if we removed um, that mode of working that is drawing? So um, I think in terms of different modes of drawing, as you can see from our presentation that it wasn't really the conventional way in which um, students would represent like the, the floor plans. You know, um, students would want to, I mean, some students would um, want to go with something more technical and go with line drawings. But I felt that with line drawings, especially when I was looking at objects within the home, it was something that lost... Um, it, it, it was something that I felt didn't capture the objects well enough in, in, in this scale of the home. Um, if I were to draw them in terms of just line drawings, and even, even if I draw in the objects, there was, it's just this quality in which, um, and there was this quality that was not captured, I felt, and that was why I decided to go with um, this mode of drawing, which was a bit more realistic with the shading and things like that. So even with that, um, the subsequent modes, I mean, the subsequent drawings that I had that that um, that represented my architecture and my intervention were also um, drawings of the same style. But with that, I felt like... Um, Yes, there was a lack of um, technical drawings that made my that made my interventions um, debatably less architectural. But I would say that in my case, it wasn't about building um, architecture. It was more about making a mark and capturing the objects, and then returning these objects to the to the to the individuals living in the home. Um, these drawings themselves, I felt like, was a way in which. I could allow the allow the users, I mean allow the homeowners to actually understand like how a floor plan would be and how the objects would relate in their homes instead of um, instead of just passing them a floor plan, you know. It's different when I pass a builder a floor plan versus I, I give the person living in the house um, uh, a, a drawing in this in, in this medium. So I guess that was that was why I chose this medium of representation. It was something that was more legible, I felt, to um, a common dollar in, in these rental flat units and I, would, I, I mean my whole project was also very drawing centric because um, I felt like it, it had to offer something tangible that people could hold on to in terms I mean instead of building like an architecture because um, situated in like a rental flat unit right it was it was a lot to do about like not having ownership over the building and or not having full ownership over the architecture and um, in a sense, the urban environment around them. So, in my sense, as what I'm, what I'm giving, what I'm sort of giving them, it's like the skill set I have as an architecture student, how I represent these objects within a floor plan, and then converting them into sort of a drawing to actually give to the residences. Yeah, I hope that. Sorry, it was a bit long, but yeah. That's fine. I mean, I, I wonder what our guests think of this, but I, I recall you talking about in your own presentation an issue. It's funny because you use the word translation, um, and, and that was an issue that you had translating uh, your studies into design at a certain scale. But it also seems like what you're doing is translation in some way, right? Because you say you want to make this architectural space, or at least the way that we think about it, legible for someone who is not trained in that skill set. Um, does that constitute as something architectural? I mean, I I I I don't know the answer. Um, I wonder what uh, Adrian thinks, maybe. <clears throat> well, I think drawing is a way of, of making it real, of giving it legitimacy. Um, the first thing we do when we approach a site is, is to draw what's there already, yeah? Um, and I, I can understand that you know, your way of, of representing it um, in this three-dimensional, yeah, perspectival plan uh, was, a, was a way of capturing the objects, not just as they occupy the floor space, but as three-dimensional things. And, and, you know, if you did that with just black and white line drawings, a la Atelier Bow Wow, would, it, would we call it architecture then? Uh, instead of with a kind of gray shaded 
drawing as you did. Um, but I, I think there's some power in, in drawing it as a form of making it legitimate. Uh, and I can see that in all three, all three projects, also by, by uh, Yong Chan, you know, this drawing of the person feeding the boars by the side of the road. I don't know if the subject is architectural, but certainly the, the method of drawing it is. And I would say that's something that's specific to the architectural language of drawing, that it holds a certain power of legitimacy uh, that is different, say, from another artistic form of, of drawing. People are convinced by it somehow. Um, what do you say, Eric? Well, I mean, it's funny because when Natasha's, I mean, I had seen it previously in the final review, but just on a kind of cursory level. This is the first time I've really seen the project. And when you were showing those um, kind of one point perspectives from up above, I could only think of this movie Taxi Driver by Martin Scorsese. If you haven't seen it, you should go see it. And there's an amazing scene, it's the kind of violent murder scene. Um, I mean, it's quite grotesque, but the camera moves across a series of rooms, looking down um, into the room, just in the same vantage point that you are. Um, and it's like a kind of plan cut, but cinemagraphic plan cut. And so, um, I mean, I think this question of legitimacy, like that the, the fixivity and legitimacy and the kind of holding that a drawing, an architectural drawing does, somehow it's like a, it's like a survey, right? It's dimensionally mm -hmm. locating and positioning. And soon as something is surveyed, it becomes real. You know, when we look in the kind of, Adrian knows this better than I do, but when land doesn't really, kind of enter into our domain until we survey it, right? If it's kind of out there as a kind of ambiguous field, we don't really, we can't geometrically locate it. But as soon as you draw it, then it becomes fixed. And then we can kind of enter into it. And then we can start to apply legal uh, parameters to it, financial ownership. Parameters. Yeah, yeah, ownership, all, the, all of these things start to get applied. And so as soon as you start drawing, you're, in, you're kind of surveying and legitimating and making uh, real the kind of accoutrements of your inhabitants, right? That is not seen as just uh, kind of disposable and, and inconsequential, but you've all, now you've legitimated the kind of stuff that people have. Um, so I think that's an important act of the architect. Um, and, but I would, then I, I still come back to this question. If you didn't do that survey, if you didn't do the drawing and you used film like Scorsese does, but gave the same kind of visual um, lens, is the filmmaker also legitimating? And is the film made, I mean, what is the difference there? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you did this, you know, research in your own thesis, but I, I think that that's an important question. So if, if you're not, a, I mean, either you are a filmmaker, and that's what, again, you should be doing, or you are not, and if you really want to stay as a kind of surveyor and map maker, that's a, that's a kind of, that's another form of expertise. I mean, I, I, I just wonder if I can offer something. It's, it's very funny, because just yesterday, um, one of my friends asked me, is architectural research quantitative or qualitative? And I was like, I have no answer for that. <laughs> It's, 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 it's not a binary that we, we talk about, right? It's, it's, um, but there is, a, it, there is still an empiricism to, to the drawing, right? That there needs to be measurements that are taken. There needs to be also an interpretation of it and a judgment that we learn um, as architectural skills. I guess the problem is when drawing stops becoming relevant, which you, which you raised earlier, where it starts becoming an obsolete act and we don't need to make lines anymore, Maybe that's where this becomes a bit murky, um, and I and and I don't know. Um, the I, I guess I would would ask Yong Chen now because um, he he, you said something very interesting um, uh, in your own presentation when you were talking about nuisance, um, and you said you didn't even though you had all those drawings, even though you had all these things converted into architectural drawings with sections, plans, and all these other kind of diagrammatic stuff done in line work you said you could not find a way to make it architectural. 
Um, I thought that was very, very interesting. Uh, and I wonder if you can kind of elaborate on that, right? Because there's, there's something embedded in it. There's a, there's a skill set of translation, um, which Natasha also brought up, but there's also then the anxiety of, well, not anxiety, but this, this kind of necessity, at least in the thesis, to make something into an architectural project. Um, I wonder if you can take us through that a yeah. bit more. Sure. I mean, of course, there's a whole, there's a whole issue of the, the architectural thesis, right? I mean, this, this is not about the thesis, but the demands of the thesis is half proposition, but also half competency proving to some, to some degree or some, there is some element of that that still retains, I guess, if the, if the discipline is centered, as Eric says, then the proof of the competency of precision perhaps is important in some way. But at the same time, the, the subject matter itself didn't want to be, the, the, I didn't have a way of, even with the precise drawings, it didn't have a way of turning into something that I could make a stand on. That means the, the, proper, that means the observation was precise, but the proposition was, the, the spatial proposition was lacking, I feel. That's what I feel, because there was no value to the nuisance itself. It was an observation of what happens in space, but I couldn't do anything with it, right? And that, that means I, had, I feel like I had the language of architecture, but without the, without the thing to direct the language at, if that makes sense, right? And I kind of want to ask that, to Eric actually, which is, or rather the, I guess to both Adrian and Eric, because this idea of language seems to come up quite a lot, right? Um, the expertise is in the language of communication, if I understand your point correctly, to make, to make it precise and communicate it with, to make you, things the, real. The part about instruction as well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, to make it real in space by surveying the land, making it real, to make it real by passing it on to contractors, to builders and such, right? But then, as you also said, the, the, that same language is not sacred anyway, because it's going and it's going to be gone soon. So if I type in a code and 3D print a building, which they're doing in like I don't know, Venice or something, I'm sure, I'm sure they're going to do it soon in real life, in a build project, <laughs> right? There wouldn't be a drawing at all. It's just, it's just it's equally precise as lines of code, and it wouldn't be a drawing. So what, what I'm wondering is, does it strengthen the discipline of architecture to say that this is our boundary, or does it weaken it in a sense by saying that all oh, this is going, but we're not going to take anything back. Well, because I, I mean, maybe yeah. if I just chime in here, I mean, I, I think we're at a very in, interesting uh, inflection point. Um, and I don't think the path is clear mm -hmm. forward. Um, yes, you could be a kind of computational jockey um, and think that everything is just going to end up in code. And, and to some degree, it probably already is. Um, when we use AutoCAD or Revit or, you know, it's already just lines of code in the background, but yet translated into what looks like lines. Um, I, I was reading a, a, a text about a month ago, and I would encourage you all to read it um, by Kiel Mo. Uh, it's called Unless, and it's about the Seagram building. And um, what he basically argues is that our entire um, way of describing architecture um, is in a way highly problematic and, um, you know, I'm summarizing, so I'm going to do this in a very crude way. But basically the kind of, we can go back to drawing that kind of externalizes everything. So there's a whole set of realities of the larger architectural world that could be material sourcing, where you're getting the aluminum from, where, what forests you're chopping down what uh, people you're displacing, what labor is, you know, you're extracting out of uh, India. Um, all these externalities are removed, we could argue, by the drawing. And they are not part of the kind of picture. So the picture in which we construct is largely a visual one and is largely a kind of formal one or a kind of, we could say, a painterly one. And that has externalized all of these other things that impact the discipline. And he's arguing that basically we need to find ways of internalizing all of those things which we have historically externalized. So, and I, he doesn't quite say it in the text or at least, you know, in my cursory reading of it about the drawing as kind of part of the problem. And I would argue that it is part of the problem because the drawing, um, at least the way in the kind of Alberti legacy is a, is about a kind of abstraction and a reductivism. So it purposefully abstracts and makes reductive and removes. 
Now that's for expedience and its primary um, act is about precision and line and edge, right? Which comes back to surveying, right? So it's, it's a surveyor's instrumental kind of drawing, but it doesn't talk about the carbon of the stone. It doesn't talk about the labor. It doesn't talk about the climate that's embedded in the drawing. I mean, not, all of those things are removed. So I think what, that's why I say we're at a very interesting inflection point where maybe there needs to be a lot more interrogation um, of what are the kind of tools of, of representation, which may be visual, but may also be um, computational, may be kind of data-driven, may be qualitative, may be uh, surveys, a whole other set of kind of representational devices that we would become experts at that would then synthetically come together. So we would have less externalities and you know, the, our expertise would be on that kind of synthesization. I mean, I just saw that as a kind of provocation. Thanks, Eric. Uh, I, I think um, I'm gonna just uh, throw a question in from the chat. Uh, Lillian asks, <laughs> Eric, interesting observation that these three projects are not architecture. Can you please elaborate why? I mean, no, as I said at the, the beginning, um, they are about the larger architectural world and material world and spatial world, but they are not, um, I mean, other than the kind of drawing, I mean, back to that kind of professional, they're not about the kind of profession of architecture. And it's not about uh, the kind of idea that someone's going to come hire you. Let's just say that that would be a, a they're coming to you for a kind of expertise. They might come to you to buy a, a kind of painting or, you know, they might be nice mirrors for you to kind of contemplate how you might translate that some way into the future, um, into kind of practice. But they are themselves right now. I don't think that they are um, in the profession. I would also like to just add to what you're saying. I think the, the drawing is a platform for speculation, right? To imagine not just what's there, but what could be in a thousand variations. And the person who makes that translation from what is to what could be is the architect. Yeah, that's something that we specialize in say more than other the other professions involved in that process. I think that's also the problem of the thesis project is you spend all this time getting to know and getting to document what's there. And then you have to make this critical leap where you say, okay, I have to project something else onto this. And if you think it's perfectly fine the way that it is, or you've kind of gotten cozy with your subject, uh, I see often in thesis projects, not just here in other, other situations, that that's a, that's a difficult leap to make. Yeah. I mean, I, when I say, I mean, I just want to kind of encourage this, the graduates. I mean, when I say it's not like in the profession or in, I mean, it comes back to my initial point, which is that I don't believe, I mean, everything is architecture but not everyone is an architect. I, I think there has to be some kind of line there. So um, now everyone might bar be participating in architecture, right? I mean, my father would make things and my mother would make things and my kids make things, but I don't believe that they, they're participating in the kind of world, but they are not necessarily an architect or, or doing architecture per se. Um, but don't take that as like a kind of negative uh, comment or like, oh, I'm not really in the profession, so I'm excluded or I'm outside of it. Actually, I think that that's a tremendous space of freedom. Like that's why I say, go be a filmmaker, go be a performance artist, go, there's a whole, there's an amazing skill set that you have in through five years of NUS that allows you to do tremendous things outside, outside the profession, not everyone, needs to be an architect who comes through our program, nor should they be, honestly. Probably, my hunch is that maybe 10% of you will become uh, actually kind of have their own practice in doing architecture in 10 years. That's my hunch. So, but don't, I don't think that that's a letdown. And I, no, I it's not. Yeah, I think it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, 
mean, Adrian went through architecture school and I mean, if I can speak, Adrian, I don't know if you can tell me better than I can, but I mean, you're, you're on, you know, you have a different trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's really important, right? Having those pathways, yeah. alternate pathways. And, and, and I think that is the title of one of the future forums, just to help them plug it. Um, <laughs> but I think Chan has one last question before we've got to wrap up. Um, Chan, you want to come on? Yeah, uh, and I'll direct this question to Eric. Uh, I think, yeah, my question is uh, going in the same vein of talking about expertise of the architect. And I think I'm going to be quite just very directly ask my question because as an academic, Eric, would you hire someone, for example, a furniture maker to teach a design studio? And I think there's a lot of like other connotations. So it, I think the other connotations are, uh, for example, an architecture trained furniture maker, does he do architectural design? Because for example, in studios, that's what we teach, right? And does he have the expertise to, does, does his creative practice have that expertise that you value that he can bring to the design studio to teach the students? Um, I mean, I would be happy to hire uh, a furniture maker if she wanted to do that. Um, I mean, or I wanted to contribute to, to, the, to our program. Um, for me, that doesn't, that's not a very, uh, that's not a, that's not a foreign thing. I, I don't know how it was for Adrian's education, but when I was educated, furniture making was part and parcel of my education. I mean, I spent a lot of time in the shop. I learned welding. I did furniture for a semester uh, or two semesters. I could show you some kind of ugly, weird chairs that I did. Um, and I thought that was an invaluable education because you learn about the ductility of steel. How do you bend it? You learn you know, how plywood goes together and how to cut, uh, you know, solid timber across the grain or with the grain. I mean, you learn the kind of material realities of the material world. Uh, and that becomes a kind of entryway into it. I mean, I would love to, to have more of that in our program. And, you know, unfortunately for you, the shop has been quite mediocre. And, you know, the point of the shop, at least historically, I mean, we can trace this back to the Bauhaus and earlier, but was that you would understand the, the kind of material logics so that when you did design, you knew that the material you were working with, it can do certain things and it can't do other things. Um, it's not just a line on a piece of paper, on a, on a drawing, you know, it, it, and you can't just keep yelling at the contractor to make it work. I mean, there's limits. And I think that that's the great thing about being in the shop. I don't know, Adrian, how, what your experience was, but. Yeah, I also had this kind of classic Bauhaus um, uh, education, um, but maybe, maybe there's a new version of that now uh, with 3D printing and with, that's a new materiality. There's something that the robot can do. There's something that the CNC mill can and cannot do, right? And and if we are moving away from this traditional two-dimensional black and white line drawing and into program space, three-dimensional printing, whatever the next thing of that is, um, right? We have to we have to have kind of a new material library that we work from yeah entirely entirely yeah yeah funny enough eric uh we also made very weird and ugly chairs <laughs> which were the, we were the last batch to make weird and ugly chairs actually so <laughs> I, maybe you have one in the bag we've got that in common <laughs> I think I yeah i mean it's funny because we we did those chairs and then the semester after we did 3d printing um, uh, so, so weird, you know, uh, the pivot right there. Um, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I am loath to end because we're, we're, we're reaching the end of the session already, but, um, maybe just to summarize for everyone, I think we've had a very great discussion about, um, architecture maybe as a, a very wide discipline, but also architecture as a profession that then specifies it into a certain basket of skill sets. But these skill sets, as we've talked about, drawing, making, whatever they are, um, uh, directing, they're also skill sets that are not um, static and neither are they stable. Um, and, and they're things that maybe uh, as, as we grow as a civilization and technology, 
um, continues to advance uh, may become obsolete. And that's something for us to consider also both in the institution and outside. Um, also, apparently everyone here should go and consider a career outside of architecture. Um, but that's a, a more of an encouragement than anything that. else. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree, right? I mean, I don't care about buildings. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I think um, uh, I'm going to pass the time back to Chan because he's going to give a few closing remarks and, and also uh, uh, plug the next few events. Um, Chan, back to you. Yeah, so really thanks everyone for the wonderful discussion. So unfortunately, as Sam said, this is all the time we have. Uh, and I really appreciate everyone for taking the time out of the weekend to be here. And I also believe that our audience feel the same way. So and to the audience, please feel free to send us an email to committee at nusgradshow.com. The link is in the YouTube chat if you wish to give us any feedback. And of course, it would also be greatly appreciated if you want to leave us any positive comments as well to pass down to the future batches. So that's all for the forums happening this week. Stay tuned for the next cluster forum, uh, which will be titled Thinking, Computing, Designing Space. Pretty relevant since we just kind of talked about the uh, moving away from line drawing and into co computing space, which is happening on uh, next week, next Saturday, actually, July 17th, 3 p.m. Singapore time. So uh, with that, I want to thank everyone and have a good weekend. Thank uh, also thanks Eric, thanks Adrian for taking our time out during this very precious Saturday, I believe. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thank Adrian, it's it's great to see you again. And we should have you uh come visit.